is it that you're asking of me? And uh, I don't know where you're at in your spiritual walk with Christ. I don't know what you're experiencing right now in life and in your family. But the Lord knows it. And uh, the amazing thing about the Word of God is that it speaks to us individually as if we were the only ones there with God. And so this morning as I open the Word of God, I know that I'm not who is worthy to expound and share the Word of God. Only He is. And He's the one that has chosen mortals to, and to share this pulpit. And I thank your pastor, uh, dear Pastor Bell, that's given me extended this invitation. It's the first time that I'm here with my church family here at uh, Fontana. And I need His help. I need God's help this morning. I know that you need His help as well. So I'm just going to um, offer up a short prayer once again. So I invite you just to bow your heads with me. Dear kind Heavenly Father, Lord, the time has come for your people now uh, to hear your word. And so we know, Lord, that, uh, that your son long ago said, sanctify them through thy truth, thy word is truth. And so, Lord, we want to be sanctified this morning. We want a greater revelation of your word, of your plan in our lives as individuals, as a family here um, in Fontana. And so, Lord, I pray that as we open your word, that we may open our hearts and minds, that the things that separate us from you may be put aside, the distractions, Lord, many times our body is physically here, but our mind could be other. And so bring us back, Lord. Wake us up, not only physically, but spiritually this morning, so that we may not miss out on the blessing as we partake of that heavenly food, uh, which is your word. And so use me according to your will. Cleanse my mind, my heart, my lips. Empty me of self and fill me with your Holy Spirit. For all these things we ask in Jesus' name and God's people say, Amen. 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 God's character on display is the title this morning. And it's interesting how I was, as I was listening to bits and pieces of the Sabbath school this morning as I was coming in and out, um, I said, Lord, there's a connection. Because what was the Sabbath school lesson this morning? What did it deal with? Last day deceptions, right? And what greater deception has the enemy of the soul given to mankind after he began his rebellion in heaven? His plan was now to bring it down to this earth and men to join in this rebellion, what greater deception has been uh, than the lie that our God, our Creator, does not love His creation? Amen. Where He has totally tried to disfigure the image of God in man, and by doing so, man, God's creation will end up hating their Creator as it was His experience up in heaven. And so many times, like, we see that these things that we see around these last day deceptions, the root of it is where God's character is really put on trial. And in this great controversy, we know that we're living at a time throughout history, we know that as believers, as Seventh-day Adventists, we have called this conflict of the ages, the great controversy between Christ and Satan, truth and error, where here the enemy of the souls displays his character, and God also displays, and man must now make a choice of whose character will they not only follow and believe, but whose character do you want? Do you want the enemies or do you want God's character? And so this morning, like I said, to talk about God's character, we're stepping on holy ground, and so we need His help. Now the Bible is clear in Deuteronomy 29, 29, the secret things belong to the Lord our God, but those things which are revealed belong to us and our children forever, that we may do all the words of the law. In other words, there are things that in my mortal mind we cannot yet, we will never comprehend, especially in this life. But praise be God that He has revealed just enough to mortals that we can understand not only that He exists, that He created us, that He loves us, and that He has a plan and future for us. And so that's what we want to know this morning. Now, in the beginning, when God first created our first parents, all was perfect. The Lord said all is, was good, right? First day, second day, third day came the sixth day, and then the seventh day when he rested. And man at this time had perfect communion. They saw God face to face, just like I'm talking to you this morning. They would hear his voice audibly. And all was harmony between God, between the, the first couple, but unfortunately, this did not last very long. And we all know the story. Then comes the temptation where man uh, is presented the first lie that says, uh, you shall not die. In other words, man was deceived for the very first time where man was tempted to think that they could exist separated from their creator. 
Isn't this what the world is doing today? Isn't this the slogan of the world that do what thou wilt, do whatever you want, live and let live? These are all the slogans. And unfortunately, more and more, not only to our young people, but also the adults, people are falling for this last day deception. Amen. That man can believe that they can do whatever they want and yet live forever separated from God. And we see the sad results that were brought about God in His mercy. Not, he gave them hope. He gave them a promise of, re, of a soon redeemer that would come to save them. But we know that they have, must for a time be tested against outside of the presence there in the garden. And this is what brought about the problem of sin. This is the problem that has plagued us since the very beginning. The problem is sin. It's the same problem that plagues you this morning. It's the same problem that plagues society. It plagues our church. All of it we can trace back. Whatever we see when it comes to suffering, whatever we see, the problems in the family, the apostasy that we might talk about, the deception, all of it, the root cause of all of this is the problem of sin. And sadly, this sin did not only affect our first parents and their descendants that we see the results today, that we are living those sad consequences up into our days, but it also caused a sad dilemma for our Creator. Did you know that our sin, my sin, the sin of humanity since the very beginning put God against the wall. It gave God a sad dilemma where man, the creation, put its creator in a sad situation where now these hard questions now would have to be answered. Now God in His mercy and His infinite wisdom, He could already, He foresaw the inception of sin. He did not cause it, but He made plans for it. And He provided a way of hope and escape. And that hope and escape is what? In the person of Jesus Christ. And so this is the sad dilemma, and I don't know if you'll agree with me, but these are the questions that it brought about. How does a loving father, talking about God our Father, deal with sin and the sinner at the same time? It's a dilemma, right? How does a loving father do everything to save a child while respecting their free will? Isn't this the same thing that sometimes those of you that have had the privilege to be parents... I've had to, and God, and of course, our, our Father up in heaven in a greater sense. What about this question? How does a loving Father deal with rebellious children that want to destroy His other children? Now, this is very sad that because of my sin, that because of the sin of the world, we put our Creator into this sad dilemma. We're now, as a surgeon, as a doctor, has now had to do, how do I save the patient, the victim of sin, how do I remove sin without killing its victim? You know, I have friends that are in the medical field and they've had to make some pretty difficult decisions dealing with things as, such as cancers where they pretty much have told a patient, this surgery is going to be risky because we're going to remove it, but there's a risk that it might, you might also not make it. And so God, as the, as the surgeon, as the doctor of healer of not only the body, but the soul has had to have this sad dilemma, how does he deal with the sinner and sin at the same time? Now Satan, on the other hand, the one that brought about this rebellion, at the same time he is the one that brings about and he tempts man to join this rebellion, and then when man falls into deception, then he goes and tempts man to actually blame God for the consequences of their choices of sin. Satan is constantly at work with intense energy and under a thousand disguises to misrepresent the character of the government of God. With extensive, well-organized plans and marvelous power, he is working to hold the inhabitants of the world under his deceptions. God, the one infinite and all-wise, sees the end from the beginning and in dealing with his evil plans were far-reaching and comprehensive. It says it was his purpose, not speaking about God, not merely to put down the rebellion, but to demonstrate to all the universe the nature of the rebellion. God's plan was unfolding, showing both His justice and His mercy, and fully vindicating His wisdom and righteousness in dealing with evil. In other words, uh, let us think twice before we put God on trial. When we don't understand everything, what God has had to... We put God against the wall. We put his back against the wall. Now he's had to deal. How does he deal? How does he save his children from this play called sin while at the same time revealing his displaying his character, which is what? Love. Okay. 
Satan, unfortunately, and we know that man has bitten that apple throughout history, just like our first, just like our first parents, they bit into that apple, believing that uh, the devil provided for them some secret knowledge, that God was somehow withholding from them something that was for their happiness. Later on, they found out that it was God who was protecting them. And so man continues now with his two deceptions that we see, and sadly, these deceptions have been in the God, among God's people since the very beginning. Since the Old Testament, the church in the New Testament, all the way into our days. There's two deceptions that are going around and they continue to our very day, even among God's professed people that have, uh, and amongst uh, the professed Christendom. What he does is that he always takes man to the extremes. Isn't the devil always taking man to the extremes? We see this even in political world, like always to the extremes. But this morning, we don't want to go to the left or to the right. We want to be centered right on the Word of God this morning. The doctrine of eternal torment in hell teaches that there is a literal place of fire where the devil, his angels, and all the wicked men will burn, rise alive, and be tormented forever. We've seen that throughout history, this, this doctrine. In other words, while the saints enjoy peace and joy in heaven for eternity, unrepentant sinners will be kept alive to be tortured for all eternity. Some churches teach that this place exists now, and they teach that at the moment of death, the souls of wicked men are sent to this place. What a terrible doctrine that has done one of the worst that has totally tried to disfigure and destroy God's character in the mind of man, of who he is. The second is another extreme, just as dangerous. Some people call it by different names, uh, universalism or universal salvation. It's the belief that every person will go to heaven when they die. In other words, God's love is so irresistible that it doesn't matter what you do, what you believe in the end. God is so loving that everyone will be saved. Another way that people often express this idea is that all roads lead to heaven. This belief is based on the principle that God is love and therefore would not send anyone to hell or punish them. Just as dangerous, brothers and sisters, because if this is true, then we're wasting our time here pre preaching the gospel. I mean, what's the point then? What would be the point then? Just let people live and let live, and in the end there's no need for Christ, because in the end they're all going to be saved because God's love is irresistible. But brothers and sisters, God's love is not irresistible because he's given man free will. You know, this doctrine, these doctrines have so disfigured the, in the mind of men that even the unbelievers, they hear about God, and yet they cannot in their minds, in their mortal minds, uh, see the problem of suffering, what the devil has caused, and yet in their mortal minds, they thinking themselves to be wise, they've come to conclusions about who God is, about his character, that unfortunately leads man to destruction. Here's one of the greatest if I'm not going to say the word greatest or infamous atheist of the 21st century, Richard Dawkins, uh, he said the following about God, specifically the Old Testament. He says that God is arguably the most unpleasant character in all of fiction, jealous and proud of it, petty and just, unforgiving, a control freak, vindicative. And of course, I can read the list that it saddens my, just my heart just to repeat what it says. But sadly, brothers and sisters, this is the belief of more and more people and as the world becomes more and more secularized. And sadly, this is what our young people are learning in many of these secular institutions. To not only doubt the very existence of God, but even hate the very concept of a personal God. You know, this has been the problem that's plagued many, even that believed at one time or have believed their faith has been shaken because they don't understand how this great controversy must play out until God says so, until the very end. And so many have come into concept, well, maybe God does exist, but he's, maybe he's playing a cosmic experiment, just like a rat in a maze. Maybe God does exist, but he's just doing all of this, and he's testing some, and, and he's testing us, and he puts us in this maze. Others have gone through the false doctrine of deism, where they believe that, yes, God created us, but he just kind of left us to our own, to our own demise, he left some laws there in nature, and pretty much he's kind of apart. There's no such thing as a personal God. You know, God's character has been questioned by his children throughout biblical history, throughout world history. Do you remember the story of Job? Here's a man that's suffering. He didn't know everything. We get the little bit of behind the scenes that Job did not know what was happening, that controversy between Christ and Satan. 
and yet Job did not understand, and yet we see three different responses by the people within the book of Job. The first one, Job did not understand, but yet he was able to say, blessed be the name of the Lord, even in suffering. What was the second response? His wife, why don't you just curse God and die? And what was the other response from his three friends that supposedly came to represent who God was, but they ended up misrepresenting the character of God in front of Job? And they pretty much said, you know what? God is punishing you for something. You must have done something evil. And so God is out, was out there. That's why he punished your children. That's why he punished you. That's why you've lost everything. You must have done something to anger God. Three different responses, all like doubting or questioning. Now, even Job, we see most of the chapters in the book of Job that even Job, his faith was shaken up that many times he asked some pretty hard questions. Did he get all the answers that he wanted? No, no. You know, and yes, brothers and sisters, sadly, even today, I don't know if this has happened to you. God forgive me that it's happened to me in the past when I've seen things that maybe I don't understand, the problem of death by suffering. Lord, why didn't you answer the prayers the way I wanted them to be answered? And we've pretty much, without saying it, but we thought of it, is that we can do better than God. God, if I was, in, if I was God, I would have never created Lucifer, because if I would have known from the very beginning that he was going to fall, or God, if I, was, if I was God, I wouldn't have allowed this war to happen or this person to die. Have we ever doubted God? and thought that we can do better than him? Brothers and sisters, really? Mortal men, we can do better than God? In other words, we think that we're a lot smarter than God, that we can run the entire universe. He has all the galaxies in his hand, all the creatures, heaven on earth, here, every one of us, as if we were the only ones, and we think that this problem of sin, or death, or suffering, that we could have done with it better than God? Really? But just because we don't sometimes understand the way that things that happen to us. Now the question, this has plagued humanity since the beginning. Why, if we have a God that is all love and all powerful, why does suffering happen? We have, people have written books on this, schools okay. of theology. Religions have debated this, believers and unbelievers alike. And yet many times, sadly, we don't want to go to the source to get this answer, which is the Word of God. And this is, we need to understand, brothers and sisters, that I don't have all the answers. I don't know why things, maybe specific things, have happened in your life. I don't have the answers. But I do know this from the Word of God. The Bible does give us the reasons why suffering happens to everyone. Believers, unbelieving, the wicked, and the, the wicked and the just. First of all, we need to understand that sin is the ultimate reason for all suffering. Whether it's by choice, our choice our, or the choice of others that affects us. Second, the temporal consequences of sin affect all of us, and like I mentioned before, and this includes nature. Isn't nature suffering as a result of sin? Man's choice? Doesn't the Bible say that all creation is growing? Third, we need to understand that mankind, sadly, we increase our suffering by the choices that we make or the choice of others. In other words, this includes breaking God's moral law, civil laws, health and nature's laws as well. In other words, the other day I was working in the backyard and I was putting up a, sort of like a little fence in there. And how many of you have uh, stubbed your toe or hit your thumb with a hammer? Now, I hit it. Now, is there something metaphysical or something that happened that somehow God was punishing me because I... I, the hammer hit over my thumb, or was it that I simply broke a law of nature, and that if, uh, because of force and momentum, that if I hit my body with something, then I'm going to have to suffer the consequences. If I go up to this building and I decide to throw myself, and I get injured, seriously, or even death, can I blame God for that choice? I have decided that I'm going to break a physical law, thinking that I can out, like, outlast overcome the, the law of gravity and so I put myself where I'm increasing the suffering upon myself and it is not God's fault and we need to be honest it's not even the devil's fault it's our choice now a lot of times I've heard people say well I don't even wear seat belts because I believe that God will protect me brothers and sisters there's a fine line between faith and presumption if you're driving faster than your guardian angel can fly 
then you're putting yourself in a situation and whatever consequences happen next, we cannot blame God for the choices and the consequences for that. Number four, there is an enemy, and we need to understand it. The book of Job makes this very clear, that there is an enemy of the souls that is constantly trying to bring direct suffering and pain, specifically to those that have given their lives to God. Specifically. Now, a lot of people say, well, is it a coincidence that those that are out there are enjoying their fun and they're having quote-unquote success? No, it's not a coincidence. The devil, to a certain measure, leaves them alone. The problem and the conflict starts in your life is when you want to give yourself to God. A lot of people have told me it was after I got baptized, George. That's when I started having problems in my family. That's when I started having problems in church more. It's not a coincidence, brothers and sisters. Because when you give your life to Christ, that is only the beginning of the conflict now. The great controversy taking place in your heart and your mind. We need to understand, brothers and sisters, that there's two things that coexist at the same time. They're not mutually exclusive. It's not either one or the other. But they both can exist mutually at the same time. One is God's sovereignty. Is God sovereign? Yes. Amen. He is on the throne. But at the same time, He has given us... After I believe that it's the greatest gift after the gift of salvation is Son Jesus Christ, the greatest gift to man is the gift of free will. The, the, the fact that we can choose to love Him freely or even choose to disobey Him. Yes, it brought a risk. The Lord knew that this added a risk when He created us, but He gave us that because love can only be given freely by love. Now we need to understand it, and I wish that there was more young people this morning because a lot of times when I share these types of messages, I speak to them because I know the struggles that they're going through. Mixed messages where the world is telling them one thing and God is telling them another. Whose voice are they going to hear? What about us as adults? We need to understand, brothers and sisters, when it comes to uh, understanding God's character and how He deals with suffering, we need to understand that yes, man has been given free will, we're free to do whatever we want. In fact, right now, you could get bored and fall asleep while I'm preaching this morning. There's nothing I could do about it. You can walk out. But you know what we're not free of? And we need to understand, we are not free from the consequences of the choice that we make. Mm -hmm. Either for good or for bad. There's a saying that says that life is like a restaurant. You can have anything you want as long as you're willing to pay the price. In other words, life... Like I said, you go to a restaurant, the waiter's not going to say, no, 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 you look like you can't afford this menu, get out of the restaurant. You can pick whatever you want, you can order all the drinks and desserts, but what do you have to do before you leave those doors? you got to pay that bill. And in this life, no one gets away with it. Though There's a principle of what the Bible calls, we uh, reap what we have sown. God is not mocked. In other words, sometimes we might yet be jealous of those out in the world, says, but they have success, they don't even believe in God, they have no idea. Brothers and sisters, don't be deceived. No one gets away with anything in this life. God is not mocked. Whatever we uh, sow, that's what a man will reap. Lamentations uh, calls us, Wherefore does a man, living man, complain a punishment for his sins? Let us search and try our ways and turn again to the Lord. Brothers and sisters, when we're dealing with the consequences of the choices that we have made that have separated us from God, we need to turn back to God. Instead of complaining, we need to turn back to God. That's what we need to do. We need to understand also, brothers and sisters, in this problem of sin is that it infects everything it touches. Years ago, I was taking out money from the ATM, and as I was walking back to the car, I saw a pregnant, pregnant woman there. You could tell she was pregnant. It wasn't because of just a little, a little extra weight, but she was definitely pregnant. You could see it, the little belly bulge, and, and she was smoking marijuana. And I thought to myself, Lord, at that time, I was probably like 19, 20 years old. Of course, I was even scared of I felt something, I was like a little bit angry just to see it, but I said, if I tell her something, she's probably going to throw something at me and yell, and maybe there's, she has her boyfriend or husband in the car. I said, my God, and people were staring at her, and I thought to myself, oh Lord, have mercy on that child. Now, whatever happens, we don't know, but so many, I work as an educator, I'm an elementary school teacher, and so many, I see more and more happening, even more now with this COVID pandemic that just passed, a lot of kids, alcohol, fetal syndrome, uh, cognitive defects by what the parents have put into their bodies during the pregnancy. You know, 
Are those kids to blame? No. But we need to understand that sin infects everything it touches. And if it does, brothers and sisters, let us think twice before we willfully sin. Because not only will the consequences fall on us, but we can hurt the very people that we love around us. Are you guys tired already? Are you guys bored of the message? No. Fall asleep? No can you give me just a few more minutes to continue? Okay. We may be called to suffer even for doing right. And that is the last point that I made. Beloved, do not think it is strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you as through some strange thing. Some have thought that is something happened to you. But rejoice to the extent that you partake of Christ's suffering that when his glory is revealed, you may also be glad with exceeding joy. If you are reproached for the name of Christ, blessed are you for the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. On their part, he is blasphemed, but on your part, he is glorified. But let none of you suffer as a murderer, a thief, and an evildoer, or as a busybody in other people's matters. Yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in this matter. Brothers and sisters, suffering is part of the human experience. But if we are to suffer, let us suffer for doing right. The Bible says, no, none of you suffer for breaking God's law, because then that is not God causing that pain, or that is the consequences of the choices that we have made. If we are to suffer, then let us suffer for following Christ. Indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ will be persecuted. This is the reality because the servant is not greater than his master, brothers and sisters. The world does not understand. The world, in its fallen condition, has loved darkness and not light. And so when the children of light want to present this message through their life, the world doesn't understand it. And what's happened through our history, even up to our days, sometimes even our own blood family or even our church family might, under might understand when we, when we make decisions for Christ. Yes. And so it says all who desire to live a godly life in Christ will be persecuted. We need, to, we need to understand, brothers and sisters, today that there's two sides of the same coin when we talk about the character of Christ. We read it this morning. There are two sides, and what are those two sides? God's love is composed of two things that exist at the same time, and that's mercy and justice. Can you have mercy without justice? No. Can you have justice without mercy? No. no. Unfortunately, many people have either tried to think that God is all mercy and no justice, and others have said, no, God, I want you to be all justice and no mercy at all. So sad, brothers and sisters, that when we give our lives to Christ when we still have not had a deeper revelation of Christ's character and who he is, we can fall into the temptation where we either understand only one side of his character and not both. You know, many times we say, but Lord, that person has really harmed me. Don't you say that vengeance is mine? Says the Lord, well, hurry up, Lord, bring justice in my life. And if you, if you want to use it as an instrument of your justice, well, amen, Lord, so we can get back at that person. And we don't want mercy. Other times, we want only mercy, but only when we have sinned against God. When we sinned against God, we want Him to have mercy. When other people have sinned against us, we want justice. You can't have it both ways, brothers and sisters. <laughs> he prays God that He is fully mercy and fully justice. He does not treat us as our sins deserve or repay us according to our iniquities. Stop with the complaining when we think we complain against God. He is all loving. He is merciful. Imagine he treated us as we deserve. Will we be here this morning? No, brothers and sisters, for as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear. And sadly, the world, unfortunately, we are at fault as well. The world has not had a full representation of the character of God. The world has not seen it many times among even God's professed people. I say to you that likewise there's more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 just persons who need no repentance. Is this a God that's always out there to destroy sinners? No. These verses say the total is contrary to what man or man in his, what they understand is total contrary to their perception of this God. Like he's some dictator that's some cruel that's out to get the sinner and destroy him. Brothers and sisters, but then the question is this. Difficult questions. People have asked me this. From the outside, I remember in my college, I used to study with uh, just friends that were not believers. And they used to ask me, well, you say that you believe in a God that's all love. Then they would find these examples in the Bible. We have done this before. Let's not, let's not uh, pretend that this had happened to us. And it's shaken up our faith. What about these passages? What about the flood, the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah, the, 
the firstborn of the Egyptians being killed during the Passover, the slaughter of the Canaanites under Moses and Joshua, the slaughter of the Amalekites, including women and children. And what about the last plagues in the book of Revelation? People have asked these. Well, if God is so loved, then how can he punish like this? That is because we have not understood that other side of the coin. Yeah. That God's love is composed of two things. What are they? Mercy and justice. justice. Brothers and sisters, we need to understand this great principle. That God is a holy God. Don't you say amen? amen. The Bible says that he is a fire. He is a consuming fire for sin. But if the unrepentant sinner... Give, uh, exercising his free will, refuses to separate from the sin, whatever it is, unfortunately it gets a point where the sinner now becomes identified with the sin itself. And so then God has no choice. If he was really loved, then he has to be justice because suffering and pain cannot keep going on forever. There needs to be an end because then he would be an unjust God. Thank you, Lord. Don't... Don't I get an amen? amen? Now, we have examples that so if we only read them superficially, then we're going to put God on trial and say, God, well, you aren't loving. How could you dare to do this? And, and so we have examples, the destruction of Jerusalem, the flood. We have Ananias and Sapphira. We have the, uh, Lot's wife. And we have the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. Brothers and sisters, we need to understand that sin is a very serious thing. It's not to play around with. Many times the world, and even unfortunately the professed Christian world, has taught us some cheap grace. That in other words, God's love, all it can do is forgive us from sin, but it cannot give us victory over sin. That's called cheap grace. In other words, Christ's uh, suffering on the cross, all that pain and suffering, the heart of the Father leaving heaven, leaving his throne, all that was just to forgive us so that we can continue sinning? That's it? There's no power of victory? Brothers and sisters, let us think twice. Now, we also need to understand that God's sovereign will works in the context of our free will. He is sovereign, but praise God that He is such a merciful God that even when He displays His mercy and justice, it works within the context of free will. Let me give you an example. Some of the people have said, well, what about those Amalekites? What about those women and children? Brothers and sisters, God never desired to bring about what the world calls genocide on anyone. When the children of Israel left Egypt, just enough, if they would have been faithful, the children of Israel, just the wonders and signs that God had done in Egypt was going to be enough to make the Canaanite people make a choice, either repent and join God's people or leave that land. It was never God's desire to bring about some slaughter. Sadly, Amen. sadly, it was God's people because of their rebellion and backsliding that they ended up having to force God, force in quotation marks, to, instead of God's plan A, he had to move to a plan B. Yes. And so this was God's desire. He says, I will send my fear before you. I will cause confusion among all the people to whom you come. And I will make all your enemies turn their backs on you. I will send hornets. He was even going to use the powers of nature to just drive them out. Not to slaughter them. He was going to give them a chance to even make a decision. Some of them ended up joining. Right? We have examples of some, like the Moabites that joined God's people. We have the example of Ruth. The Hivite, the Canaanite, the Hittites from before you. But sadly, it was God's professed people many times. Our sin, our sin leads us to give such a terrible testimony that causes the unbeliever to even blaspheme against God. And so these nations, they hardened their heart as they saw that Israel was also in the camp with the Midianites, dancing and singing and joining the false idols. And so what it did to these people is that it hardened their hearts and it made them, and so now God had to teach both the lesson to these people, but also to his professed people by teaching them that sin is such a grievous thing in his sight. And so God had to use them as an instrument of his justice. So sad, brothers and sisters. In the fourth generation, your descendants will come back. In other words, God had given all these people over 400 years since the time of Abraham to repent. God is merciful. Don't you say amen? amen. But he, there comes a time where he needs to put an end to sin. And he does it for the sake. Remember that question, that hard question? How does a loving God deal with one set of children that want to destroy his other children? We have put him in this dilemma. This is not God's making. 
We cannot know how much we owe to Christ for the peace and protection which we enjoy. It is the restraining power of God that prevents mankind from passing fully under the control of Satan. The disobedient and unthankful out in the world, those that make fun of God and the concept, those have so much to be thankful for, have great reason for gratitude for God's mercy and long-suffering and holding and check the cruel, malignant power of the evil one. But when man passes the limits of divine forbearance, that restraint is removed. God allows us then to suffer, the, exercise our free will, and suffer the consequences of the choices. This is the cancer. A lot of people say, well, what about those poor children? What about, why did they have to suffer? Brothers and sisters, the cruel reality is that cancer is a sin. That sin is a cancer. I had a friend that worked in the military. He went to Afghanistan. He was in the military, in the army. He was a sniper. And this is what sin has brought about, the cruel consequences that even the children, even today, have lost their innocence. And evil and sin has infected even our very youth and our children. That they are plagued, that if they had the opportunity, they would also destroy God's people. This is what was the result of these Amalekites, that they taught their children, as soon as they grow, grew up, they were going to always have constant war with Israel and destroy God's people. It was sad that because of the choices that the parents have made, the cancer infected them. And so I was telling you that this, uh, he was a sniper. And he tells me cruel stories that he still can't sleep at night many times. Like what we call post-traumatic sin, war syndrome, right? He ended up having to kill very young people because in certain ideologies and philosophies, they strapped their very own kids and young people into villages to wipe out everybody there. And so in to save those that were in the village or save his own army men that were stationed at a specific village, he from far away at a distance before those people could even enter a marketplace, he had to snipe them and execute them. Some being as young as 12 and 13 years old. Brothers and sisters, is this what God has brought about? This is what man has brought about. Amen, amen. The seven last plagues. A lot of people have wrestled with that. I wrestled that for years. Lord, how? Isn't there a way to keep, just save, save uh, the sinner without having to destroy them, brothers and sisters? Even when God carries about this final work, the Bible says that this is a strange work. You know that it is strange for God to have to destroy the sinner? Because in His nature, His nature is to bring life, to do everything to bring about the salvation of the sinner. And when He removes His protection and allows this unrepentant sinner to suffer the consequences, even then it breaks God's heart. It's a strange act. And so even in the end, when the destruction of the wicked and this earth comes, it will still be an act of love. But it will break God's heart. Because man has chosen. You know, hell was reserved for only the devil and his angels. The Bible says that it was only reserved. It is man by his choice that has joined in this rebellion. And now we will have to suffer the consequences if we remain in that state of rebellion. Are you guys tired? Can you guys give me five more minutes? Yes. Okay. God does not stand toward the sinners in execution of that sentence against transgression as so many think. But he leaves the rejectors of his mercy to themselves to reap which they have sown. Every ray of light rejected, every warning that has been despised or needed, God, I don't want anything to do with you. Yes, I know it's true, but I'm still going to continue in my ways. Let's think twice, guys, before we have that rebellious spirit. Every ray of light rejected, every warning despised or needed, every passion indulged, every transgression of the law of God is a seed sown which yields its unfailing harvest. The Spirit of God persistently resisted what we end up knowing as the unpardonable sin, is at last withdrawn from the sinner, and then there is left no power to control the evil passions of the soul yeah, and no yeah, protection yeah. from the malice and enemy and the enmity of Satan. In other words, Absolutely. if man chooses Satan, then God says, well, then you will have to suffer the cut of the one who you have chosen. And you know Satan is not going to give you life. He's out there to destroy you. See, the problem people don't understand is that Satan is the perfect terrorist. He knows that he's a defeated foe. The only thing that he left to do is to take as many people with him to destruction, to, to, uh, to hurt God's heart. He knows he cannot go up to heaven and take him off his throne. What's the next next thing? What's the worst thing you could do? Would you rather want someone to hurt you or hurt your children? For those of you that are parents know that it hurts more when someone goes after your children. Yeah. 
The destiny of the wicked is fixed by their own choice. Their exclusion from heaven is voluntary. This is not God's making with themselves and just and merciful on the part of God. Amen. God is not going to kind of send anyone to heaven or hell that doesn't want to be there. It's their own choice. You know, we're going to get to a point when Christ comes in glory that even the wicked and Satan will have to bow and confess that Christ is Lord. Even the sinner will under, understand this, the unrepentant sinner. Great and marvelous are your works, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are your ways, O King of the saints. Who shall not fear you, O Lord, and glorify your name? For you alone are holy, and all the nations shall come and worship before you. For your judgments have been manifested. That at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of those in heaven and Amen. those on earth and those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. Even Amen. Satan himself will have to bow. And he will recognize that just and true are God's ways, that he is there by his choice. That God gave him every opportunity to remain in his presence in heaven. And it is by his choice that he brings about his own destruction. God is love, brothers and sisters. And now, what does this mean for us? What does this even mean? I could bring a message and you say, well, that's really nice what this young brother said this morning, but how can we apply it to our church family here in Fontana? Brothers and sisters, God has now called us to reveal God's character to this world. And his character is revealed of two things, mercy and justice. How can we reveal mercy and justice to this world? Well, brothers and sisters, the way that God has been merciful to us, we need to show mercy to others with the sinner as well. How many times we want God to be merciful to us, but we don't want to be merciful to those on the outside? What about justice? Brothers and sisters, we can also be tools of justice in this world. What about when God asks us to stand up for what is right, even when it's not popular? We can demonstrate God's justice when we say, you know what, I'm the only one, just like in that picture, but I'm going to say, no, this is wrong. This goes against God, his principles, and even within God's professed people. Can we demonstrate both things at the same time? This can only happen if we have been touched by his love. If we allow the Holy Spirit to transform us so that we can have the character of Christ and to this world, we can display both sides, mercy and justice. Never just one without the other, both at the same time. For his purpose, for his glory today is the same that he had for Israel when he brought them forth from Egypt. By beholding the goodness, the mercy, the justice, and the love of God revealed in his church, the world is to have a representation of his character. Amen. Have we failed? Many times. And when the law of God is thus exemplified in the life, not only the preaching, even the world will recognize the superiority of those who love and fear and serve God above every other people in this world. Brothers and sisters, the, jur the church right now at these moments, Christ, we don't have his physical presence and he's left his church as his body. We are called to be God's hands and feet into this world to alleviate the pain and suffering. In other words, we complain a lot about the problem of sin and suffering, but yet God has called us to alleviate pain and suffering in this world. Amen. And we have not done it. If we really care about the pain and suffering of this world, of those around, of the hunger, of the homeless man, then what are we doing about it? When God has given us every tool to alleviate pain and suffering in this world. I'm going to close, and this is my last, uh, last couple, two slides left. I'm going to introduce you to this man. I'm sure you've heard of this great story. You can verify it for yourself uh, on the internet. Forgive me if I pronounce it wrong. Uh, Dash, Dashrath Manji. Uh, a man from India. Uh, you're familiar, he passed away a few years ago now. Uh, the story goes, there's different versions, but the, but the story, uh, the consensus is this. His wife ended up have suffering from an injury. He lived in a very uh, poor village away from the big cities there in India, a very poor village, and he, his wife ended up suffering an injury, and the nearest hospital was so far away that he was not able to get her on time because they had to go over this rocky pass. The villagers, even if they wanted to get to the nearest city that provided some kind of medical care or a clinic, it was just too far away to get there. Sadly, the story goes that his wife passed away from her injuries. You know, it broke his heart, but 
Dashrath Manji didn't just stay there in a moment just of just his depression. What he did is that he put that into action where he said, you know what, I have suffered a great loss, but I don't want anyone else from my people in my village to ever have to suffer this again. And you know what he decided to do? He decided to get a hammer and a chisel, and he decided, and he did this for over 20 years of his life. He decided to carve a path 110 meters long, uh, over nine meters wide, and over seven meters deep through a ridge of the hills using only a hammer and a chisel. After 22 years of work, Dashrath shortened travel for his village, for the villagers between Atri and Wazir Ganj, blocks of Gaia district from 55. So in other words, he was able to shorten the pass from 55 kilometers to only 15. When people saw him, don't you think they made fun of him? This guy is crazy. A hammer and chisel all by himself, no heavy equipment, no machinery. Sadly, it was only after his death that the Indian government finally saw the results. And at, at least we can say today that the government stepped in after death. They completed the work and they completely made a, a pass through this ridge now, through this canyon. And now there's a road that's connecting these villages. Brothers and sisters, he did something about human suffering. He had suffered something, a great loss. He could have spent his whole life complaining. But what he did is he took that suffering and he decided, I don't want anyone else to have to go through what I'm going through. And he did, dedicated his life to make a way. Isn't that what Christ did at the cross? Amen. That he did not leave us in the falling condition. Whenever we doubt about God's character, yes, many times in this life we might not get the answers that we're searching for. We might not understand why did this person have to pass away. Lord, I prayed. Lord, I was faithful to you, and yet I, I lost that job. Lord, I was faithful. But brothers and sisters, when we ever doubt, dwell on the cross. That is the greatest manifestation that we do not have a God that left us to our demise, but he is a God, a personal God, that desired so much to be one with his creation that he sent his only one and begotten son. That's whosoever shall believe in him, shall not be perished, but have eternal life. And in the cross, we see both aspects of God's love and His character. Mercy and truth are met together. Righteousness and peace have kissed at each other. That yes, sin is a horrendous thing in, front, in the sight of God, but He did everything and has done everything to save you and me from the penalty of sin. It is the darkness of misapprehension of God that is enshrouding the world. Men are losing their knowledge of His character. It has been misunderstood and misinterpreted. At this time, a message from God is to be proclaimed, a message illuminating in its influence and saving in its power. His character is to be made known. Into the darkness of the world is to be shed the light of His glory and the light of His goodness, mercy, and truth. And so I thank you this morning for your time and attention, for the opportunity to uh, be at this pulpit. And may God bless the reading and hearing of this word this morning. Amen.